In to order, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Again, good evening. Uh, should have a copy of the agenda. I will read the opening comments. The meeting purpose, what it is for. To review the 2019 proposed budget and tax levy, seek public comment and have discussion. What it is not for, taxable market values of specific parcels are not a topic of discussion. Property classifications are not a topic of discussion. 2018 values and classification for taxes payable in 2019 were finalized at the County Board of Appeal and Equalization meeting on June 11th, 2018. I will add a few of my own notes to that. I know a lot of you are probably here for specific, for, uh, specific to your property values. Um, I've, uh, Sue is here and is going to um, address the, uh, the group. I think where she is, excuse me. Address the group. Uh, she won't be taking any questions at that time. Uh, after she speaks at the formal meeting or this meeting, she, uh, we have a room reserved down the hallway. So if you want to ask some questions specific to your property taxes or basically everything I just listed that's you know, not on the agenda tonight, you can feel free to go down the hallway and do that. Uh, once uh, we are complete uh, with that, uh, we'll have some presentations from staff as far as the budget and the levy. Uh, once that is complete, we will open the floor to the public. I will give you three minutes to speak. We can go past that if commissioners have specific questions and if you and you have specific answers, and then we'll be happy to continue the conversation within reason. Uh, when you address the board, please come to the podium. Bring the, this is gonna sound like a lecture, it's not meant to be. Please bring the mic to your level. It's difficult to hear in this room. The acoustics aren't great. Um, and if you don't, I'll remind you of it. It's not to be rude, but it's difficult for us and the and the public to hear uh, if you don't use the mics appropriately. Uh, give your name and address, uh, talk about your concern. Uh, if we have an answer, we'll of course share it. And if we don't or cannot, we will make sure that the proper people get back to you. Uh, again, keeping in mind the uh, part of the meeting is not for the evaluations of your property or the, uh, the values specifically. All right? With that, we will get started. I will call on our assessor, Sue Schultz, to address the board and the public. You're going to have to use the mic. So it's going to be a little awkward. Her back's going to be to you, but I'm it's, sorry. it's the only mic setup we have. OK. Um, well, my name is Sue Schultz. I'm the county assessor. Um, one of the processes when we do, um, as part of the, the taxation process, is that we have to value property based on market. So one of the things that we look at is we do what's called a sales ratio study every year. And we look at what property sells for um, to what we have them assessed at. And we are required by law to be within a, a market of, of a minimum of 90% and a maximum of 105. So when the sales come through, we take a look at them and we do what's called a, the ratio. We take a look at that ratio, we array them. That middle number has to meet 90% at a minimum and 105 at maximum. On this, it's a valuation adjustment. There's a handout back there. Um, if you didn't get it at all, what it does is it shows some of the adjustments that we made um, for the 2018 assessment year. Our sales run from October to September, which means that for the 2018 assessment, we looked at sales from October of 2016 through September of 2017. So at this particular point in the cycle, um, we are two years out on, on the market of what we have done on our adjustments. The egg land, um, the sales that came through on the egg land, and that's the only class of property that we look at as a county as a whole. Our ratio was approximately 116%, so we did a significant reduction on the tillable land um, on the agricultural properties. The residential was starting to see an uptick. So what you see there is, is some of them went up um, significantly, some of them not so bad. One of the things that happens in our process is that we look, we have to, um, the Department of Revenue mon monitors what we do. 
So if we don't hit that 90%, they will actually come in and give us what's called a state board order, and that comes in June of the year. So Sumter, um, we were supposed to be at 90. We hit 89.68, um, which was about a 15% increase. Um, because we didn't hit 90, we actually got another 5% on top of that from the Department of Revenue. So even though we went up 15% and we were close to the 90, um, we didn't hit it, and so we got a state board increase on Sumter Township on the residential. So everything that happens throughout the county um, in our office, specifically for sure, is mandated by law. And if we don't do it, um, the state will come in and do it for us. But one of the impacts of that that your residential people are seeing is because egg went down and residential went up, is that there's now a shift of the tax burden more onto the residential than there are in the egg. So we have been seeing some significant increases on the residential property taxes, um, partly due to that class shift of valuation um, due to what the market is doing. Okay. Anything else? Unless anybody has any questions. Okay, well, we'll adjust the okay. questions. Uh, so again, for those of you who walked in late, this would be where Sue is going to, is where are we going, Sue? We're at the far hallway down here on the left. Okay, the meeting um, room. so down the hallway, uh, to the left, if you have questions about your property tax and the values, now that is where you want to go to get the answers for that. All right? So feel free to follow Sue down the hall, and uh, we'll go from there. All right. With that, I will now call on our Auditor Treasurer, Connie Kurtzwig, to review the 2019 tax information. Good evening. So I will be addressing um, the packet that says the third row 2019 truth and taxation hearing okay so the contents are there for you just pay special attention to the tax glossary which gives an explanation of terms used throughout this document if you have any questions as we go along pages one and two are 14 reasons why your property taxes might go up and down Number one and two actually refer to the market value that Sue just talked about. I do receive many calls about market value and we defer them to Sue and her assessor team. Um, so number four, the increase or decrease of the county budget or levy, and five, the city budget or levy, that would be dependent upon the needs of the entities. The rest of these, I'm not going to go through each one in descriptive. Um, I will let you do that at home. I, I will point out, though, on page 2, number 12 and 13, so the state legislature also, as Sue indicated, may have changed class rates or other um, adjustments to the tax base that is out of the county control and maybe even the city or township that you live in. Page three refers to the property tax levy and the tax base and tax rate. The top portion is the state of Minnesota, and the bottom portion is McLeod County's numbers. So pages four and five talks about who does what in the property tax process. The assessor, I'm Again, I won't read each one for you. They're listed there. But the assessor's basic role is regarding the statements um, is the value and class that is on the statements. And then the taxing districts are the assessments that may be placed upon you for utilities or um, um, changes to your property or the budget and levy. And then on page five, the auditor treasurer's role is the tax capacity, tax calculation of the statements, and then to distribute the settlements. So what that means is the dollars collected for other entities other than McLeod County. On page six, um, it lists the it, what you should do if you think your property is over assessed, the four steps there. So the first one would be to visit your local assessor's office, and that um, you would want to do in March when you receive your valuation notice along with your tax statement. And then the second step would be the town board of review, 
the County Board of Equalization, which meets in June, and then the Minnesota Tax Court. Pages seven through nine detail out the property classification rates from the Department of Revenue. These are mandated by them and the county has no control over the class rates. Um, the assessors do make class rate changes to your property and so you would wanna pay special attention to that box one on your tax statement to make sure that no classification changes have occurred. I do wanna point out um, on page nine that for payable 2019, this refers to agricultural homestead, that that value has decreased by $40,000 for, um, for the first tier. So what that means is that $40,000 will be being taxed at 1% rather than 0.5% as it was last year. Page 10 is the 2019 proposed tax capacities by taxing entities. This lists out all of the tax capacities for the 14 townships and the nine cities. The fourth and fifth columns, which would be blue and tan. So 2018 final total was 37,143,094. And the 2019 proposed is 38,562,914. And then you can see the correlating um, increase to the dollar amount and also the percent. Last year, that percent increase was 2.29. Page 11, which is the one that goes um, landscape, is the taxable market value, net tax capacity, tax incre increment capacity, and local tax rate. So at the very right column, proposed 2019 taxable market value is 3,892,785,400. Total net tax capacity is 38,943,877. Tax increment of 319,921. Total taxable tax capacity is 38,623,956. And the local tax rate is 58.863. So you can see for McLeod County that's charted for a 10 year comparison um, in the bottom section of the page. The 10 year average is 56.1502. So this year our rate is up 2.7128 from the average. On page 12, um, is how to actually calculate a property tax. So step one, if you have a market value of 100,000 classified as residential homestead, you'll wanna calculate the tax capacity and, and to do that, you need to reduce it by the market value exclusion. I have a lot of questions on this homestead market value exclusion. So the maximum amount is 30,400, which is 76,000 times 40%. If you're, if you're home was $76,000, that would be your amount. Now, since our home is over that at 100,000, we need to subtract the first 76,000 because we already had that times 40%. This is where we're figuring out our market value exclusion um, to get 24,000. And then on that third row, 24,000 times 9% is 2160. So from the very beginning, the 34, 30, 400, you subtract the 2,160 to get the 28,240, which is the market value exclusion. So from your 100,000, you're gonna subtract the 28,240 to get the taxable market value. So then your taxable market value times the 1% class rate that we talked about in a couple pages earlier, mandated by the Department of Revenue, is $718, that's your net tax capacity. Um, so the third thing, determine the tax rate. We're gonna assume that there's a property located in the city of Glencoe, in the GSL school district, and in Buffalo Creek watershed. The proposed payable 2019 local tax rate is 149.3970. 
and the proposed payable 2019 market value referenda rate is 0.12760%. So you're going to take your tax capacity from above the 718 dollars um, it's not dollars yet, it's value, times 1.4937 to now get the dollars of 1,072.48. Then you're going to take your market value now of $100,000 times your rate to get 127.60, and then you add those two together to get the gross tax. So I just want to also point out in number three, the 149.3970% that's the total local rate. So that includes all taxing di districts, which would be all of them that were listed, Glencoe City, GSL, Buffalo Creek, McLeod County. Sometimes I see in papers where someone will say the impact of GSL is $9.14 to you know, the property, but that perhaps doesn't consider all of the other taxing entities that you would need to add together. Okay, and then on page 13 is um, just a descriptive of the homestead market value exclusion, which I just went through the calculation that you can um, review again at home. And then I've also detailed out there how to calculate the agricultural homestead market value credit that hasn't changed for 2019. And then on page 14, is how to calculate the school building bond ag credit. That was new for taxes payable last year. That shows up on your proposed tax statement, but it's, it's calculated for your final statement, but it's included with the other ag credit. So it's a little deceiving, but it's still there. Um, and then on page 15, gives the back ground of the statewide general tax, <coughs> excuse me, which is for commercial, industrial, and then also seasonal, residential, recreational. So this year the rates are 41% and 20%. And then on page 16, the state general levy commercial industrial tax capacity. This was new last year, and so there was an exclusion for the first 100,000 of market value to provide tax relief to small businesses that own property. The state general levy was also reduced to minimize the tax shift implications of this exclusion. So I listed here, prior to the exclusion payable in 2017, the county total of state general CI was 3,345,661. And then in payable 2018, the county total actually decreased to 2832644 So that's $513 and $17 that was not charged to taxpayers that was in the previous year for the state general. In the proposed payable of 2019, that didn't change too much, but the exclusion is still there. At the bottom of the page, I did list out also the state general tax rates for payable 17, 18, and now proposed 19. You can see that they have actually decreased um, over the last couple years. On page 17, the taxing entities net tax levies. These are all of the levies for the townships and cities, school districts, county, special districts, and then the market value levies also. So for proposed 19, the very total, grand total, is 58,683,636 for a total percent increase of 5.53. So page 18, which relates also to page 17, this is just a pie chart of where your taxes go. So the, you'll notice that the amounts from page 17 go to page 18, and then also I've added the state general tax on, on there, or the capacity. So the county is 37%, townships have 4%, cities have 22%, schools have 31%, special districts have 1%, and then that state general tax has 6%. 
So the total of all those is 61,570,273 and um, last year that number was 59,102,047 which is a 4.2% increase. And last year I was telling you at this time <laughs> that that number was a 3.4% decrease. On page 19 is the taxing entities rate comparison. These are all of the rates based upon um, the levies that we receive for the townships and cities, again, school districts, the county, special districts, and market value of the school districts. And then on page 20, are the preliminary county levies. I put on here the comparison to neighboring counties. So Carver County had a percent increase of 4.9, McLeod's is 7.1, Meeker's is 3.8, Renville's is 3.1, Sibley's is 2.9, and Wright is 17.3. Actually, Cindy has some additional information about the Wright County percent increase. So during the board meeting, um, we talked about uh, the debt issue that we um, just did. And Wright County did a, was it a $60 million improvement project to their courthouse or a new building? And that's why you're seeing the 17.3% increase for their tax levy is because of that new building. And that's why we considered not building at the footprint at the courthouse for a $35 million project versus the $12 million project that we're currently looking at for the new government center. Thank you, Cindy. So the, the middle section of the page has the comparison to similar populations. And you can read those, but they're, you know, going from 2.5% or sorry 1% to 9.17%. And then at the bottom I do have the comparison to neighboring counties, the proposed tax rate. So I also left on there the final for 17, the pay, final for pay 18 and now the proposed for 2019. So although we do have the highest um, rate in McLeod, you'll notice that the others are increasing also. So the final page that I'll go through is page 21. This page sort of summarizes a lot of things that I've talked about. I pulled some random samples of um, ag homestead, ag non-homestead, residential, and commercial. And so you can see the increase and decrease and percent change for 2017 to 2018 and then also for 2018 to propose 2019. This demonstrates exactly what Sue was talking about, where the ag is seeing a decrease and the residential is picking up the piece of the pie. The commercial you'll notice at the bottom of column three, I guess, is this column three set. That is where you can see where the state general tax exclusion kicked in, where those um, businesses saw that relief. So with that, the, re the rest is just the tax glossary with um, expl explanations. And that concludes my portion. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Excuse me. Thank you, Connie. I'll now call on Colleen Robeck to discuss the review and review of the 2019 budget and tax levy. Hello. Okay, so the handout that I'll be going over will say um, 2019 budget hearing. It looks like the other one, but there's different information than the one that Connie had. So 
So the first page is just the contents. Colleen, I'm sorry. I think they're having a hard time hearing in the back, so do the best you can with those mics, Down? okay? We're gonna try to turn it up a little bit too, but. Is that better? You will need to speak a little bit louder. Okay, I'll speak louder. <laughs> okay, so on page one is just the organization chart for 2018. So it lists your, your district commissioners, elected officers, department heads, and other positions. And then on page two, this is the budget summary. So it compares the 2018 adapted budget to the 2019 proposed budget. So the total revenue for the general fund that is budgeted for 19 is 18,425,889. The expenditures are 18,787,856. Road and Bridge has $15,718,044 in revenue and expenditures of 16317790 Social services has revenue of 12708073 with expenses of 13237918 uh, Special revenue, now the special revenue funds are, are accounts that we have actual designated dollars in for specific projects and they'll all be listed in the pages that are upcoming. So the revenues are 1,133,213 with expenditures of 1,215,617. Debt service, we have revenues of 1,612,021 with expenditures of 1,438,640. Um, and then those are the levied, so for the levied dollar amounts, we have revenues of 49,597,240, or excuse me, these are the funds that have levy dollars, I should say. And then the expenditures are 50,997,821. Then the non-levy, excuse me, funds are solid waste with revenues of 2,619,862 and expenditures of $3,065,110. And then capital projects, we didn't have anything um, planned for the budget for, for 19. So in total, um, $52,217,102 and expenditures, $54,062,931. Now in the there's several pages that have detail to follow, but I'm only gonna have talking points on if there's major changes. So on page three, you'll see on the countywide, the revenues went up 1,027,896, and that is due to the increase for the tax levy. The administrator's budget looks looks like it went up quite a bit. And what that is, is we had restructuring in 18. So a lot of employees that were in the auditor treasurer's office, so the finance department has moved to administration. So that's why you'll see a drop in expenditures in the auditor treasurer's office and an increase in the administration office. Um, information technology went up about 56,000 and that shift is due to all of the computers will now be purchased through the IT department instead of in the individual departments. Um, the county insurance, the expenses are up and that is just due to not um, budgeting for the revenue part which is dividends because we're not guaranteed those dividends. So that's why that number, if we do get the dividends, we'll just build that much more in the fund balance. But we didn't want to, we didn't want to plan for it because we're not guaranteed to get those. Um, the attorney's office, the expenditures went up and that was from new positions that have been approved by the board. And then on page four, so if you look at the zoning office, all of those revenues and expenditures are now being moved to environmental services, which will be on a, in a few pages. And that is because of restructuring. 
Uh, okay, so then, and then we have a new department listed here from last year, environmental services building. So now that environmental services is in the solid waste building, um, the expenses for that building are going to be paid for out of the environmental services, out of the general revenue fund, because it, the building is not only used for solid waste, but for other functions in the county. Um, the county building major repairs went up 90000 and that is to, to get the elevator in the courthouse up to code. Um, fairgrounds rent is just going up a little bit. Um, license Bureau went up a little bit because one employee that was previously put under the auditor treasurer is now under License Bureau because her functions will be changing. Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, Clean, can you just clarify, going back to the county building's major repair about the elevator, that elevator is for the old elevator that was built in the 19, early 1980s yep. when the jail was initially built that that needs to have an upgrade because we've got the new elevator and that's working fine. Great. Sorry, thank you. Then on page five, the sheriff's office budget went up uh, 64,000 in expenditures and that is also for new employees that have been approved as well as the jail increase for new employees and that's for security in the courthouse. Um, the parks budget, um, just has some capital that they're planning for. That's why their expenses went up 39000 Environmental services, even though one, if you looked at 107, they were reducing their expenses by 266000 Because of savings from not filling positions, the expenses in 609 is only going up sixty five. So that's a 200000 $200,000 savings by combining those offices. So that is it for the general fund. And then if you go to page seven, you'll see the highway highway fund and the major, major construction there, a big project in there is CASA 3 for 2019. And then on page eight is solid waste. Um, some of the expenses for buildings, like I said, moved over to the general fund. But there is a um, capital plan for in the MRF for a new bailer. And then on page nine uh, is social services. And in, in the end, they're gonna be using about a half a million dollars in fund balance and mostly due to wage increases and costs of programs, which I'm gonna talk about a little later. Then the next several pages, I'm not really gonna talk about, so pages 10 through 13, because those pages are um, special revenue accounts, which already have funding in them for the expenses. And then on page 14 um, is the debt service and the capital projects fund. The only thing different that's being added is the geo capital improvement plan 2018 for the new, new government center. And that money is actually shifting out of a special revenue account. There was always money put into a 25807, which was designated for capital assets. So that money is just being shifted for 19, so there's no extra expense for the year 2019 for the building. And then on page 15, it just talks about um, the revenue coming in and different funds that it's, each fund that adds up to that 52,217,102. And then on page 16, it has the breakdown of the expenditures by fund. And then on page 17, we have our outside organization allocations. So there's been some slight changes, but in total it was about $9,000. On page 18, here's just a breakdown of the capital. 
So if you wanted to see what, what capital assets the county was planning to spend its money on, here's a list of those. So in total, it was $1.8 million. And then on page 19, this one's landscape. This is our debt as it is today. So at the end of December, we would have $10,148,854 of debt. Out of that, if you see in the blue, that is what's actually tax levy dollars. The, the rest of it is special assessments or paid or paid for out of the abatement fund for the solid waste building. And then on page 20, this shows the McLeod County gross tax levy comparison payable 2010 through 2019 proposed. So it does show there that we have a 7.1% increase. So the total tax levy being 22 million six hundred fourteen thousand five hundred ninety two dollars clean do you want to talk about the shifting there it shows it here better oh the shifting between the capital projects and the government center so that is the three hundred twenty two thousand five sixty eight we had been that's been on the tax levy dollars since 2012 going forward and it's just being shifted down out of that two five eight oh seven account into the debt service to pay that interest payment on the new building. Then on page 21, here's just a little summary of impacts on the 2019 McLeod County budget. So I want to just go over this. There's $1.1 million increase in personnel costs for 2019. Included in this amount is 466,139 in new positions for the attorney's office, social services, sheriff, and jail. The increase in the attorney's office is due to the increased child protection and drug cases. The increase in the social service office is because of increased long-term care, development disabilities, child protection, and child welfare services. The increase in the sheriff's office and jail is to secure the courthouse and to comply with the Department of Corrections. The county is changing its process for requesting new hires to be submitted with the budgeting process and not allowed throughout the year. This will help our numbers because in the past, people have been able to come to the board and ask for others all throughout the year, which then skewed our budget. And the county denied several new hire requests for 2019. County is developing succession planning. The county is working on the organizational study that was approved by the county commissioners in May of 17 to pool and share talents and improve efficiencies among departments. And by, by putting us all together in one building, we can share, share duties with other departments possibly. The county is investing in their largest asset, which is their employees. Rising health care costs, McLeod has been a participant with Sibley County in a self-insured health insurance plan, which in the past two years has experienced high claim costs, resulting in the 2019 insurance increase of approximately 10%. McLeod County is offering a $500 match for employees with single coverage and a $1,000 match for employees with family coverage that have health, care saving, health savings accounts. Rising program costs for social services, including for, total of $480,301. This, in, this included additional costs for foster care for auto home placements, child care for working foster parents, mental health mobile crisis services, extended employment services, children's residential treatment costs, and loss of federal funding. Costs of adult services at state operated facilities that are no longer required high level of care, but have no community services available. Electronic home monitoring, court ordered child custody studies, legal services, burial services, transportation costs, and local county cost share of grants such as semi independent living skills and basic sliding fee child care. The county is is concerned about the rising expenditures in social service programs and the unfunded mandates that the state imposes on county government. 
The county continues to research avenues to fund mandates, and the county continues to lobby their legislators against unfunded mandates. And last is Road and Bridge recons Reconstruction Project on Casa 3 for grading and paving is at a cost of $2.2 million. And the final page is, shows the payments on the new building so that once that goes forward, it'll show how much the county owes each year. And that's it. So if you have any questions. Does the board have any, does the board have any questions for Colleen or Connie? Stay close in case we need you. Uh, the, uh, at this point in the agenda, I will open it up for uh, public comments and discussion. Again, if you wish to address the board, please come to the podium, give us your name and address. Make sure you use those mics so we can hear you, as well as the crowd and the audience at home. So at this point, the floor is open for public comment. Does anybody wish to address the board? Hi, I'm Glenn Slotic, 15575 130th Street Hutch. Where the wheelage tax, I didn't see, is that called out separate someplace? I believe it's under the highway funds, correct? It's in the road bridge revenue. Do you know how much that was? 385,000. One comment I'd have is uh, 385,000. Is there any way possible you could uh, sunset that bit or put that one to sleep? Uh, and um, for 385,000, John, I bet you'll, if he's got a project he needs 385,000 for, uh, offered up to you a budget for it, do it. Sound reasonable? There has been some, there has been some conversation regarding that, putting it, Commissioner Kruger has championed that probably more than anybody, just putting that in the general fund. I think that's what you're saying, I don't want to put words why, in Why not? I see no reason, uh, I mean, because if, me if it's worth doing. Hear me out, that's what, that's what we were talking about. Yeah. Um, we had a conversation probably about a year ago, the wheelage tax came up. The discussion was to leave it where it was. Oh, um, no. Even, even though we had the opportunity to come up, but at some point it probably, it would be re revisited again. Doug, I put some words in your mouth. Do you no, no I, I just, Mr. Chair, Glenn, it, I, that was the compromise. I mean, there was some, there was some talk or, discussion in a workshop about adding to the wheelage tax for now. Or, adding to it. Yep. And that no, was we don't do that. No, we don't do that. No, and, no, but no, that no. was the compromise for for at least a for the least a year and it'll probably come up again. Uh, the compromise was to leave the alone but we weren't adding any more wheelage tax or um, um, the sales tax. Who said to add? There was an option to add. We said that not was in to the add. discussion. Oh, no, no, no. We don't want to do that. No, 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 no. Okay. That's all I got to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Glenn. Oh, I like one more thing. I got three minutes. Yet. That that's uh, health and human services. It was like thirty-seven percent of the budget at or of our McLeod County, and of that thirty-seven percent is twenty-four percent is what goes to health and human services. That's a huge, huge, huge number. It's a very huge number, and it's going to get bigger, unfortunately. Yeah, a lot and of when you mandated. deal with, and if you deal with them on a very personal level, that human services, you get the feeling you're inhuman because you're dealing with the telephone uh, recording. Okay. In McLeod County's level? Yeah, there, somewhere in McLeod County, there's a Melissa S. that hates Glenn S. Okay. And I have nothing against <laughs> Melissa S., but I just have a very hard time understanding these nasty gram letters that were sent. Uh, in regards to my grandfather's stay at the uh, Harmony River. And it's very cold, it's ice cold process one must go through if you're not an attorney or at least a very uh, intelligent level to that type of a thought process. Uh, and something could be done there to soften this. People are kind of uh, at wit's end when they're dealing with that. And uh, I, I had a very bad experience with that, okay? Hard to deal with. Very good experience with Jim Lauer and uh, DAV, though. All right. Happy okay. to hear that. Mr. Sprint and Attic, would you make sure you touch base with Glenn regarding that? All right. Anybody else wish to address the board? Robert Anderson, uh, 1545 Adams Street, Hassan Valley. And on page 8, on the bottom block there, we have uh, Solid Waste Fund. 
the revenues. It uh, looks like you're not uh, expecting uh, the uh, income or the prices to increase any in the near future. For their, um, Which the, packet are you in the budget hearing, I assume? Yes. Right. All right. <clears throat> Is that true that uh, you are... Uh, Prices are pretty flat and expected to stay there in the future. I'll defer to the MRF committee, but uh, prices of commodities, or Mr. Teletsky, who I think is in the audience, but um, uh, the uh, prices of the commodities have not recovered. Um, Paul, I guess I'd call on you if sure. you want to talk a little bit more about that. Yep. Uh, your observation is correct uh, that the revenues are definitely uh, not a, a highlight of, of, of a topic, uh, they're just not existent. Uh, whether you want to talk about it being a trade issue or the global issue that, that we cannot move product uh, being mainly plastic and paper out of this country to other uh, sources has something to do with it. The fact that the United States is inundated with recyclables, which has driven the commodity prices down, and we're also missing end users out there as well. And so uh, if you go back two years like 09, 10, 11, we had commodity prices that were excellent. That's when we could still export to China. Since then, they figured out that they've polluted everything they have over there, so they closed their doors. <clears throat> and so now we're stuck with it. Uh, we're hoping that uh, um, someday somebody can kind of reignite some new markets for that. Uh, other than that, this has become an issue nationwide as far as what to do with recyclables. And we compare that also to the rate that we continue to fill up landfills. Today we met with our legislators and we asked them, can we focus on waste to energy a little more? Can we see some funding or some state initiatives to try and, and utilize uh, what is filling up our landfills to generate energy and use that as, as, as a renewable energy source? And that is something that the legislature needs to work with and hopefully bring things back in check. Uh, but so that is probably a little more than you were looking for, but it does get a little bit more of a bigger overview about where this general waste flow is at. For example, Bisky has approximately 15 years life expectancy left, as well as other landfills around the state of Minnesota. The garbage flow is going to get very expensive in the near future, and it's going to make this loss look small unless we can figure out some other options. But in the short term, yes, we have uh, a definitely a collapse of markets. And, uh, and all that we can do to deal with that is to continue to look at our programs, continue to save money where we can. Whether we use the uh, recycled here in the county to generate jobs here in county and offer opportunities for adult handicapped individuals or whether we allow those markets to exist outside the county, it would still exist as a, as a negative today. All right. Anything else, Bob? Do you, have, uh, do you happen to know what the balance of that tip fee fund is today, approximately? <sighs> In millions. It, if you add them together, is it three million left? You Colleen, know what? You Colleen over? indicated to me she's got that number, so she will come forward with that number. There are two funds that, that you're asking questions on, I think. One is a tip fund, the other is the abatement. And so when waste material comes into McLeod County and is dumped at the landfill, there are two different fees that are paid. The first one is a tip fee, which the county regulates, which is currently, <clears throat> excuse me, $3.50 a ton. Again, we have the opportunity to regulate that wherever we want. The other fee that is charged is called an abatement fee. The state legislature sets that and that is currently at $6.66 a ton and that is uh, paid to the county in this case. Um, I believe uh, the, the township of Rich Valley does have a fee schedule of their own and I have no idea what those numbers are. Um, but it is those two funds together and over the past uh, few years we've seen that fund decrease as waste management has diverted uh, waste flow to um, other places and I believe one of those is perhaps the, the incinerator in Elk River. <clears throat> and so uh, we can use that tip fee as a way to regulate how fast we burn up our landfill. If we chose, we could drop that tip fee significantly and make this look like a positive, but we would acquire a lot more garbage to fill that land, fill up that much faster, and cause even a bigger problem for the county to deal with. Do we have the number yet? I think then? she's coming forward with it. Okay. I have to share the mic with her, Bob. Yeah, do you want just the tip fee or the total for the solid waste fund? <clears throat> Why don't you just, just list them out? This. Total? All of them, all okay. of them, yeah. The total in the solid waste fund as of the end of November is $2,493,835. Thank you. All right. I have one other question, and that is uh, just looking through the uh, uh, budget here, it appears as though a lot of the funds are in negative numbers. 
uh, and I haven't added them up, the negatives and the pluses. Does this appear to you to be a deficit year? Cindy, I'll let you talk about that a little bit if you want, but it's you know part of the budgeting process, yeah. and so, I guess I'll stop. Bob, are you talking about on page, on the summary? Uh, excuse well, me. Well, as I look through the, all the pages here, they seem to be... Uh, yep, so you've uh, got the negatives because that's revenue, and you got a positive because it ex it's expenses. But if you would go to look at the budget summary report, um, that's really going to tell the story okay. more so for the county, and that's on page two. Okay, very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bob. All right, anyone else who wish to address the board? Good evening, sir. Uh, good evening. Craig Bishop, uh, 221 Fremont, Ian Hutchinson. I apologize about this question. I came in a little bit late, but I did uh, want to ask you about uh, page 20 proposed tax rate and uh, could you just give me some insight a little bit on um, why McLeod's rate is so high and uh, like it just seems like well it is higher and then some of the other ones actually well Carver County went down and Meeker went down and the other three went up but why does the McLeod proposed tax rate 58 percent and the next highest one is 52 I'm just wondering about that Connie or Cindy <laughs> I guess uh, we're debating on. Sorry, we're debating on who wants to answer this question. Uh, it's so in I, the uh, it's just a second, everybody. It's in the uh, I believe in the Truth and Taxation hearing packet, correct? That's uh, right. Page twenty. Yeah, correct. Truth and Taxation right. hearing. Right, so we're all on literally yeah. on the same page. So, yeah. Uh, Cindy or Connie, would you please help so us? So this with this does change. It does fluctuate. Um, for the other counties as well, not just for McLeod County, but it depends on if the values go up, and it depends on if you have new development. Like Carver County is going to, they're going to go down because they um, have more construction, they have more commercial businesses than McLeod County does. So that's why you see them dropping. Um, they probably capitalized on the new values, and then would still be able to keep their rate down. Mm -hmm. um, we are an unfortunate McLeod County does not have a lot of development with commercial property. So we don't see that influx with the commercial. Hmm. And that's why you're seeing the, the decrease with farm values and then that class shift or the tax shift going to residential. Mm -hmm. And the values plus the levy increases the tax rate. Okay. Mr. And Chair? Yes, Doug. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you an example because I'm, I'm just an average Joe, too, to figure out all the, the, the com computing this all up and all the formulas, but I did. It just so happens that my daughter lives in, in Carver County, and I get all the comments. I've got, had some in my district that, well, we got to go to Carver because their rates are different. It's very deceiving. I, I did my homework, and, and I did comparables with her home to compare to uh, property in McLeod County, like-minded property. Her, her property taxes, granted she's, her school district taxes are a little higher, but they're exactly double of what they are in McLeod County. So, I mean, these, 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 for the same valued home, th these figures are a little deceiving because they're based on a year, on a year basis. If, okay. If they increased all the way along. Sure. They've all, they're already there, at lack of a better word. And since, okay. So, but I, I had the same questions and because I, mm -hmm. I was getting a lot of input from the same way, and that's all I can okay. it's a non scientific Doug Kruger poll, but it was exactly it was exactly twice <laughs> as I yeah, I think you know it's just one figure, and so I guess you have to put it all together, all the information together to get a better idea. Yes. I guess is, my second and last question is about uh, tra tra transit um, trailblazer, and how is that coming along um, is it more financially stable than it was, or are you getting enough drivers, or um, I just wondered how financially solvent that uh, that uh, transit system is. The anybody? The uh, the uh, budget itself that was approved by Midnot Office of Transit for 2019 was 5.4 million. Um, the share basically it's we do a ridership um, percentage. Uh, as close as we can. Wright County has 45, McLeod has 35, and and Sibley has 20, and hopefully that equals 100 or everybody's going to laugh at me. But the, uh, the, so that's where it comes into the local share, what we have to pay in. Over the last years, we've had to contribute uh, very little. I don't have the number, sorry. That's we can okay. get it for you. We've had to contribute at a county level, a local share, very little. 
based on the revenues that it's ha had. Um, we did have to contribute uh, uh, a working capital amount to keep the, oh, to keep keep the checkbook going. flush. Uh, as far as drivers, that has uh, improved. It ebbs and flows. Um, it's probably something that we're always going to work on. Uh, we've um, maybe something you don't want to hear. We increase wages to try to um, to try to uh, broaden that pool of drivers. Um, it's worked so far, or it's improving. Um, but uh, you know, the job market everywhere, right? People right. people that deal with this uh, every day um, will right. tell you it's tight. And I would agree with that with Trailblazer. Um, it's 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 sound today, um, but we are at the mercy of MnDOT with it. There is no hiding that, right? If they wanted to cut us our funding, we'd have a, a big conversation to have on regarding transit and, and rural um, rural McLeod County, Sibley County, Wright County is more urban, right? But uh, we'd have some serious conversations to have. Um, but we don't want to treat it as a blank check from MnDOT but we want to be responsible with it too. So uh, okay. hopefully I answered your question with that. No, so. that's very good. Thank you very much. All right, thank Mr. you. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Can I just expound on that just slightly? The Trailblazer Transit has three streams of revenue, basically. They have MnDOT funding, which is the bulk of it. Then they have a fare box. In other words, the passengers are paying a fee to ride the bus. And if the MnDOT funding and the fare box are not enough to sustain the system, then that's when the county kicks in its local share. So it's the better Trailblazer performs, the better off McLeod County taxpayers are because that's less money out of our general revenue fund. Got it. All right, thanks for your help. And thanks just for your to share one, other, one more thing on Trailblazer. We just, in our regular meeting, we just did approve the, the new joint powers agreement. You had your, part of your question was on how stable it was. Now, Car, uh, Wright County is now a part of that joint powers and WCAT does not exist anymore. So that in itself helps out a lot. It, well, yeah, it's a lot more well, that's stability. So. 14 cities versus one county. Yeah, yeah. You deal sure. When you had Wright County in there, I could see that could help a lot. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. M Mr. Chair, yes. uh, page 20 is one of those pages that with, the, with those charts, you can make data say kind of what you want once in a while. Uh, the box that Mr. Bishop was referring to makes it look like, you know, perhaps Renville County and Sibley County are doing way better than we are. But then when you go to the chart on the top of the page, um, you find out that that tax base distribution is a lot of the formula because Renville County is, is uh, nearly at the bottom or at the top where we look at it or one of the worst in, in, in the per capita taxation and Sibley County is right next to them. However, it just depends on how you want to read the numbers off there. You have to remember that when we add up the, the overall uh, tax value of the county, that's you're going to add up all your residential, your commercial values, which is then broken into land and machinery, uh, ag apartments, take off all of, your, all of your exemptions, and then you have the taxable value, and that's what those levies are, are, are uh, um, computed against. And so it's, it's, uh, it can be a, a little bit of a confusing page. Uh, it's one that you can kind of make data say whatever you want to make out of it. So I thought I'd throw it in there. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Jennifer Moore, 210 67 Nature Avenue in Hutchinson Township. And I think my understanding of this meeting is that you're proposing a tax levy of 7.1%. And you want to hear from property taxpayers, right? Instead sure. of county employees, yeah. of course, we don't want to see where the money is going. But just to see if we approve or disapprove, is that, I mean, what kind of power do we have as a... Well, we want we want to answer your questions that we can yeah and, and uh, we want to hear your input so yeah if you have some please share yeah so I guess I would just say um, that I would consider a lower um, tax levy instead of 7.1 percent our personal taxes have gone up like four to five hundred dollars each year for the past couple years and so I think the 7.1 is is bigger and so I would just say you know if we could go up for a lower tax levy that's my comment all right thank you Anyone else wish to address the board? Anyone else? Come on. Hi, Jim. Good evening, uh, Jim Bobier, 20926 Skyview Avenue. Um, she does bring up a good point, I guess. If you remember the rule of 72, 7% 7 goes into 72. We're gonna be doubling the budget if you keep going at this rate in 20 years, so I'll have to watch out for that. Um, I guess I'm here uh, just to kind of talk about an area for discretionary spending, and it's kind of a familiar one here too, and it's just as far as that we do spend our money wisely, 
and actually advocate on a little diversity in trails. I don't know why every trail in this county has to be paved when there's other users and other interest in writing things. Um, <clears throat> I guess uh, the last couple of years you guys have been spending money, you and Hutch, $50,000 for this trail uh, study plan. Uh, and I think you guys voted to basically help take care of the DNR to mow trails that they're supposed to be taken care of and not. And just to kind of watch it, I guess, as far as developing a lot of trails that we're not in the financial area to take care of, especially paved. And uh, I know I was there this spring when the gentleman went over at the trail committee, the uh, uh, study and for the $50,000 study and whatever, what is it, SR SRF, uh, John? Yeah, and I guess one thing too, we gotta be truthful on this stuff to the people. And he, the gentleman's out there talking, he did uh, rightfully do a, a gravel trail versus a paved. And I think it's something over a million dollar savings. But then he goes on to keep saying that uh, paved trails are less expensive than gravel. And I go to my Acoma Township board quite a bit. And I guess I can guarantee you from what I know about townships budgets, if paved surfaces were cheaper than gravel, every county road would be paved, okay? Because gravel is less expensive. And I actually happen to live on a paved area on 209 Skyview. And Acoma Township decided that we would have to pay for our own maintenance for paving. So I can tell you that paving costs more than asphalt. We need to be truthful and acknowledge that. And uh, I guess the other thing too is if you go back to the original study on the McLeod County Trail, taxpayers paid $15,000 for that study, okay? And one of the, if you look at the survey results in there, uh, the number three item was to have a sound maintenance plan and to take care of the maintenance. But yet the planning that's went into this has been nothing. The one page limited document that went in for that two miles to go into Lester Prairie. Uh, Mr. Cogden put that together. It mentions nothing about paving. It's a one page, horribly insufficient document. And I've been to a year and a half of trail committee meetings of people asking for a valid plan and nothing's come up. Finally, I found something on the internet and introduced it when that gentleman from SRF was there about a pretty sophisticated 62 page document on trail maintenance where they've got it listed in there seal coating every three, four years, and every 10 years is a major coating. And these are the same guys that we just paid $50,000 to. They've got a pretty well-developed plan from like 2012 how to take care of asphalt paving. And if we can't take advantage of this information on maintenance before we make decisions about continuing paving, that's really not financial, financial, financially sound advice. So we're two miles into this into Lester Prairie, and I think it's time we take a look at this plan and come up with what does it really cost to take care of this. And just for me bringing this up at one meeting, Mr. Al Coghlan says, oh yeah, we can take that first spray coating and work it into the next round of money that they want to ask you guys for to sign up for. It shouldn't be this way, folks. These guys are supposed to be trail experts. They're supposed to be listening to the people. There's been one survey of users on the Loose Line Trail. It was 34 people in July. And assuming the people went back to where they came from, it's 17 people for a round trip. It's not worth the kind of money you guys are looking at paying for this stuff for the minimal benefit. Money's tight. And this is tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars in long-term 20-year commitment. Um, this, is, this is not right. And if you want to look at getting some money back from the legacy fund, that's fantastic. 85% of that money to be refunded through legacy is for water conservation and things like that, not bike trails. And I challenge you, do we have anything going on in the county to get legacy money back for things like watershed and things like that for improvement? I don't think we do. So that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Anybody else wish to address the board? Anyone else? Seeing no one else, I would look to the commissioners for any comments. Otherwise, I would take a motion to adjourn. Anything? Mr. Chairman, I would just want to thank everyone for attending tonight's meeting. Uh, I appreciate your comments. Uh, the board is always listening. Uh, you know, we'd like to hear from you, not just at the truth and taxation hearing, but uh, keep in touch with us year round. So again, thank you for attending tonight's truth and taxation hearing. Anything else? Looking for a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chair, I, I guess I, I'm going to say a couple words. Just um, there was the, the young lady that spoke on lowering the, the levy or, or, or having a lower percentage of levy. Um, it's, it's something we, we like to do. And, and, and unfortunately, when, when we work through the year and, and we have to pay our bills, we, whether we make 
good prudent decisions or not. We make them. I, I would prefer to see people at these meetings when we actually spend the money, but at the end of the day, we have to pay our bills. Um, and we have mandates, <coughs> unfunded mandates, with whether it's social services, we're trying to build roads um, and repair our roads and maintain our roads. So my comment is we have to pay our bills. I mean, during, during the year, I, I, I would take the criticism on, on, on making decisions on spending or, or find better ideas to do it. But again, I'm repeating myself, but at the end of the day, we have to pay our bills. Okay. Thank you, Doug. Anything else? Uh, just to straighten out misinformation, we do use legacy funds for clean water efforts involving our, our uh, noxious, we, or excuse me, our aquatics uh, program. And our watershed districts also access funding when they can, but it takes years worth of paperwork to pull that funds out. Mr. Chair, I, I, I forgot. Thanks, Commissioner Wright. That is actually two different pools of money. They have they have some dedicated for clean water, and we are we are apply, we we applied for one and didn't get it. We're going to reapply. There are there there is money through Legacy that we are applying for through our SWCD, uh, and. Um, no, we are applying for, but it is two different pots of money. And it, you know that that fund, uh, no matter what interest you have, it is unfortunate that you have to spend an enormous amount of money and time applying to get money out of that. It doesn't matter what component of the the whole legacy program you're after. It is unfortunate the amount of effort and time it takes to get anything back. And, uh, Mr. Chair, again, uh, in that in that in that line, I. I have I have constituents here in, in my district. Trails has not ever been on my top priority list, but I do have constituents that want to use trails. And and in Mr. Commissioner's right comment there, unless you jump through so many hoops, um, we I, I had John and he ran me some numbers on our, our County Road 15 here to put a trail in there. They're they're so they're they're quite they're high and astronomical in my opinion. But um, we don't qualify for legacy funding there. I mean, uh, aside the argument of whether we need trails or whether we don't, I have quite a few uh, younger people, especially, and some older people that want to walk or want to actually get somewhere. And I have no way to go along with any funding. You know, you, you got to declare them regional trails. There's so much. I, I know the, the gentleman that spoke on it. You know, you know about the legacy funding. I, it, it's it's. It's a curse. All these funds are a curse for me because they they, they, they give you a seed money and then you got to maintain everything. But my comment, my opinion. Yeah, I've got the split I just uh, to have some factual data here as far as how the allocation of legacy funds. The arts and cultural heritage component of that is 19.75%. The outdoor heritage component is 33%. The clean water at 33% and parks and trails at 14.25%. I'm missing the amount of money that is, is raised every year, but that's what the split comes to. Anything else? Mr. Chair, I guess I would reiterate Ron's comment and thank everyone for coming tonight. And um, we do look at the budget every meeting, every day. Uh, many of us are looking at numbers and trying to figure out how we can crunch them. And if we can, I'm sure we will. Anything? All right. Motion to. Uh, I'm sorry, Rich. Uh, move to close the meeting. Motion by Commissioner Commissioner Pullmeyer to adjourn the meeting. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Wright. Any discussion? Hearing none, proceed to vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone.